I'm feeling a little nervous because seeing that we go on lockdown all the time for someone coming on campus with like guns and stuff and you see it on the news like all the time and it's like oh that could be me one day and I don't know it could be like I go to school or I go to the store and could be my last day. Personally, I can't say I feel like the government is doing anything because it seems like with different states, everyone has their own direction that they go in. As far as Texas and, you know, even Georgia, like they have open carry. So the guns can be visible in stores and stuff like that. Like there's only a few places that are off limits, which is kind of scary because you just want to walk somewhere and you imagine like how many people have guns on them right now and how safe am I in this place? Coming from the South, I feel like guns are a pretty big part of our culture. So I understand that the hesitance for gun control will not be taken by everybody. But I also believe that people should be able to defend themselves with firearms. But I also think that people shouldn't have AR-15s to do that. I'm independent, so I'm neither left or right. And I personally believe that there should be some sort of gun control. When it comes to gun ban, though, I don't completely agree on that. But when it comes to politics, it kind of shocks me overall how at 18, you're not able to drink, you're not able to rent a car, you're not able to go to the casino or anything like that. But you can easily buy AR-15. I I'm studying in public health, and of course, we talk about gun violence is a public health issue. We talk about a whole bunch of things that are public health issues. And I think having that gaze on the situation also makes me like, oh, Lord, is anything ever going to change? I think I saw something a while ago that was like, how did the people ever pass, like, the thing about cigarettes and not smoking inside or, like, around children and that type of thing? Because it feels like nothing can pass in this day and age <laughs> that is good for people. As a student, I kind of feel like I don't really know how to kind of absorb all this information because it's like, well, I kind of grew up with these incidents happening. Like when I was, you know, in grade school, these would happen. And in middle school, we had like Stoneman Douglas happen. And now we've had this Uvalde. And I like personally feel very vulnerable because like it's always in the back of my mind. Like what if this happens right now? Like I'll be taking a math test and it's like in the back of my mind, like just this really intrusive thought will appear. Like what if this happens to me in the future when I'm old enough? We'll probably vote for politicians who support policies of stricter gun laws because I don't think it's necessary to be able to purchase a war weapon in today's time. I was 18, sitting on the floor of a dorm room on May 23rd, 2014, texting friends to find out if they were alive. A shooter was raging through Isla Vista, the mostly student community by UCSB where I went to school. It was a Friday night, and the girls' dorms were a blur of crop tops and lipstick, bubbling with the anticipation of a good time. Until the sirens. Until the sirens. Then the building fell silent, and suddenly the dorm's fluorescent lights felt stifling. Through the open door, I could hear the resident advisor walking up and down the hall, telling us to stay put, stay calm, stay put, stay calm. It was like being in the eye of a storm. We were still, but calamity surrounded us. Six students were killed that night. The days after were filled with the familiar chorus of never again. But we all know that vow wasn't true. That's my LA Times colleague, Anumita Gar. The voices you just heard are of young voters Maya Conyers, Aubrey Bacchus, Kam Pyong, Alexander Simpson, and also two high school students, Jonathan Brown and Seisha Agarwal. Columbine, Sandy Hook, 
Tree of Life Synagogue, Orlando, Las Vegas, El Paso. Those are just some of the worst mass shootings who happened in U.S. history. And last month, we added Buffalo, New York and Uvalde, Texas to this list of horrors. A list that's probably going to continue to grow. But as politicians fight about what, if anything, to do, young voters are tired of waiting and are ready to take action. I'm Gustavo Ariano. You're listening to The Times, daily news from the LA Times. It's Thursday, June 9th, 2022. This year's midterm elections were expected to be a referendum on the economy, but as gun violence is on the minds of Americans yet again, millennials and zillennials who've grown up in an era of massacres might prove a constituency that no politician can ignore, if they show up to the ballot box, that is. Anumira Gar is a member of the 2021-2022 Los Angeles Times Fellowship class, and she's based out of Washington, D.C. Anumira, welcome to The Times. Thanks for having me. So all these mass shootings we've mentioned have happened over the past generation, and few things have changed politically on the national level. But in the wake of Uvalde and Buffalo, what's been the response from Capitol Hill? Just the week before last, a domestic terrorism bill that would have opened debate on questions regarding gun safety and crimes failed in the Senate. This was Democrats' first attempt at responding to the back-to-back mass shootings in Buffalo and Uvalde. The final vote was 47 to 47, so quite short of the 60 needed to take up the bill. All Republicans voted against it. But since then, Biden has come out in a speech calling for a ban on assault weapons and high-capacity magazines. And short of that, he was asking for background checks. He was asking for storage laws and red flag laws. Just a stronger response, really. I know how hard it is, but I'll never give up. And if Congress fails, I believe this time a majority of the American people won't give up either. I believe the majority of you will act to turn your outrage into making this issue central to your vote. Enough, enough, enough. And Biden has also been coming out with stats, like one that really disturbed me. He tweeted that more school-aged children have died from guns than on-duty police officers and active-duty military combined in the past couple of years. Right. And the response to local law enforcement is also under scrutiny right now. So the Justice Department has announced it would conduct an independent review of the local law enforcement response in Uvalde. The review follows revelations that Officers waited for about an hour to storm the classrooms where the gunman had barricaded himself, despite the fact that children inside were calling 911 begging for help. We just hear all kinds of gunshots going off, like nonstop, like constantly gunshots. And the world here all scared on the ground, fearing for our lives. So what might the outrage over those shootings from both Buffalo and Uvalde mean for young voter turnout, especially if Congress or the Senate has no big gun control legislation right before uh, the midterms start coming up? According to an expert we spoke to, congressional inaction in particular can really frustrate and depress voter turnout. But at the same time, it's a prime example as to why politics matter. Wait, so the guy that you talked to said that congressional inaction just leads to voter apathy? Often it does. You see a lot of young folks get extremely frustrated with really what can be viewed as a cycle of inaction, right? Tragedy occurs, nothing happens. Tragedy occurs, nothing happens. And so it can depress voter turnout, but not always. And we'll talk about that after the break. So it kind of makes you wonder how much of an impact you really have when it comes to these kinds of things, because I feel like people have been arguing about these kinds of things for many, many, many years. Like, this is not the first mass shooting we've had. They won't do anything specifically to change the laws, kind of like in the early COVID days where a lot of the senators didn't really take it serious. They didn't put in mandates for masks until they were catching it themselves. And then all of a sudden they wanted to get strict on how they regulated COVID. So I think when it personally hits one of them, that's when they'll take a serious action. Politically, it kind of makes me look at 
who's doing what at this point and who is actually actively trying to maybe pass regulations or laws to prevent gun violence. And also that makes me think of like in the future, like, oh, what's going to happen in a few years when it's time to like vote these people in and out? Because what is going to happen? Uh, I think we're coming up to the high 200s of mass shootings in our country. And I think this is a topic that's really crucial and important to discuss at all times. And we need to start making progress towards resolving it rather than being that twilight zone of just talking about it, but no actions are ever done. And those are more voices of young voters collected by producer Ashley Brown. And Amita, there's precedent for young voters to come out after a massacre involving guns and influence gun legislation. The most notable recent example was in Florida in 2018 in the wake of the Parkland massacre. What happened there? There was a horrific tragedy. There was a shooting at Stoneman Douglas High School in Parkland, Florida in 2018, as you mentioned. Uh, And it was after that that we saw a lot of young voters mobilize. And they demanded action from state officials and local officials, including the survivors, from the shooting. And so that is a great example of young people feeling energized to come out and impact change. We want to have conversations with President Donald Trump, Senator Marco Rubio, and Governor Rick Scott about the fact that they are being supported by the NRA. And we want to give them the opportunity to be on the right side of this. That was Parkland shooting survivor X Gonzalez, and they were very vocal during that time, along with a lot of their classmates. Yeah, within weeks of the shooting, Florida legislators enacted new gun restrictions. Young people also pushed for nationwide reform, and their protests and demands for reform were what our expert called a key driver for the historic youth turnout in 2018. Not because we are going to be another statistic about mass shootings in America, but because we are going to be the last mass shooting. Dode Moomin is another prominent activist and organizer who sits on the board of directors for March for Our Lives, a nonprofit that many of those survivors from Parkland helped start. Just last month, they placed over a thousand body bags on the National Mall. These body bags are 1,100 body bags spelling out thoughts and prayers because that's what they have been doing for four years, sharing thoughts and sharing prayers. And that's what it gets us, more body bags and more deaths. We want to remind American politicians and U.S. Congress that we demand substantive and transformational action on gun violence, right? Passing universal background checks, providing a comprehensive plan. How are we going to combat gun violence? And March for Our Lives is also planning a big protest next week in D.C. on June 11th. We have over 450 marches planned around the country and the world. And contact your government and tell them to advise travelers to our country that they are not safe. Your kids are not safe here if they come to the United States. And we need to make our government embarrassed internationally that this is a problem. That's David Hogg, and he's been tweeting and giving interviews recently about how he and other survivors think now, this time, that there's actually going to be large-scale change with gun control. Anumita, do you get that same feeling from your peers? Of course, young people aren't a monolith, right? You're always going to find a variety of opinions. However, by and large, and with the experts that we spoke to, young voters often feel that each shooting goes through a very typical cycle. A tragedy occurs, Democrats and gun control advocates demand legislation to regulate the use and sale of guns. Republicans, the National Rifle Association, and generally gun enthusiasts will offer thoughts and prayers and seek to put the focus of the issue on mental health and not firearms. Congress ultimately ends up doing nothing because there's often a stalemate in regards to legislation, and then everyone moves on. And then another shooting occurs, rinse and repeat. So there is some sense of hopelessness among youth on the issue. I wonder if in this case with Uvalde, since the victims were all fourth graders, not necessarily so prominent online, that maybe if there would have been more anger if it was another Parkland, because in Parkland, they were all high schoolers. They're all plugged into social media. They knew how to interact with this media age of ours. It's hard to say. Similarly, when Sandy Hook occurred, right? There was a lot of outrage, but of course, Sandy Hook, it was elementary age students that didn't lead to any sort of action, legislatively speaking. More 
after the break. And Amita, so there might be some political movement when it comes to gun control. Even Republicans are talking about some stuff, not this time, not nothing. But what do surveys say about how young people feel about gun laws in general, like as a motivational factor for them to want to go to the ballot box in the first place? The expert that we spoke to definitely mentioned that these sorts of incidences, this trend, does push more young people to side or identify with the Democratic Party because that is the party that's seen as at least attempting to make some efforts on gun control, gun safety. In addition, there are specifically in California some data points that show these types of laws do reduce firearm deaths. So California, according to statistics from the CDC, has a much lower rate of firearms deaths compared to states with more lax controls, such as Texas and Louisiana. But it's important, I think, to keep in mind that this is all within the backdrop of the fact that firearms were the leading cause of death among young people in the U.S. in 2020, even overtaking car accidents to become the primary cause of death for Americans aged 1 through 19. In addition to that, active shooter drills are now standard in 95% of U.S. public schools, which really signals to youth, to young people, that similar to earthquakes or tornadoes, mass shooting events are inevitable. And again, it reinforces this cycle for young people that this has become the norm and politicians have no real tangible plans to do anything about it. I can't even imagine being a young person, whether a teen, a young adult, a kid, and growing up in that environment. But Anamita, you not only have grown up in that, you're a survivor of a mass shooting incident, as you mentioned earlier in Santa Barbara. How does living in this impact your peers politically, especially when you do see politicians talk a big talk and then nothing really happens when it comes to gun control, at least nationwide. Yeah, I think the impact is undeniable. So many of us have either watched constantly through the years, tragedy after tragedy. Many of us have now also, as you mentioned, lived through some of these, including myself. And I think that the impact is massive. I think it has shifted the way that we think about voting and government. It's shifted, again, as experts have said, faith and trust in Washington leaders to enact change, to do something about it. And again, while it's led some younger voters to more closely identify with the Democratic Party, they still remain frustrated that Congress has done little to address it. I feel like my vote's just gonna go through one ear and out the other. You gotta look into who you wanna vote for and actually care about what's going on and also read their policies, what they wanna do, what they are doing, and go from there. And just encouraging my friends to do the same because I know we all do get wrapped up in like a little bit of hopelessness when it comes to our government and I just don't want us to get stuck in that cycle. I do feel the need to inform my community, inform others, and overall just make sure the right person is elected so that real changes can occur and our kids, our parents, us, you know, overall, we can all live a safe life in general in the U.S. I'd like to grow as being more intentional with my research when I'm voting, but as a young voter, like I said, it just makes you wonder how impactful your vote is because it just seems like a lot of corrupt things going on and that our politicians who are currently representing us don't have the best intentions for making this a safer place to live. I do not think they are moving fast enough because it's been more and more and more shootings and people at my school don't really take it heavy. They be making jokes about it and I feel like it's not something to joke about and it's not really funny. It feels really scary because like you don't know if your parents are going to be one that get the call that their child didn't make it. 
I think that these laws should be reevaluated in the future. And I would love to see the place where future generations, because I don't think it's going to happen by the time I graduate high school, but I hope to see an educational environment where kids can just go to learn and they don't have to have intrusive thoughts and the idea of someone coming inside the school, their own classmates, you know, shooting them. It's like an oscillation, kind of like this country. Either people get super politically motivated to push for gun control or they just say nothing's going to happen. So why even bother? Absolutely. And I think for me, after having experienced what I experienced, it just leads to a large amount of, honestly, rage when it comes up again and again and again and nothing has been done. Anumita, thank you so much for this conversation. Thank you for having me. And that's it for this episode of The Times, daily news from the LA Times. Ashley Brown was a hef on this episode and our show is produced by Shannon Lynn, Denise Guerra, Kasha Brasalian, Ashley Brown, David Toledo, Angel Carreras, and Surya Henry. Our engineers are Mario Diaz, Mike Keflin, and Mark Nieto. Our editor is Kinsey Moreland. Our executive producers are Jasmine Aguilera and Shawnee Hilton. And our theme music is by Andrew Eben. Like what you're listening to? Then make sure to follow The Times on whatever platform you use. I'm Gustavo Ariano. We'll be back tomorrow with all the news in this madre. Gracias. <laughs>